I it's haven't what, eaten any carbs for three days, so I've already lost two kilos. Just for this interview. Just for this interview. Yeah, that's good dedication. Now listen, whilst uh, Lucy's doing the makeup, you got to tell me yeah. whether I look totally like non sferatu. <laughs> <laughs> We're delighted to have here again on Sketch Notes on a Pandemic, Professor Mark Antonio Spada, a professor of addiction and psychology at London South Bank University, who has identified a new syndrome called COVID anxiety syndrome. We've done a previous podcast uh, highlighting the fact that up to one in five people still has will have some elements of fear, even if the fear is disproportionate to the actual threat. And Professor Mark Antonio Spada will now talk to us today about how that research has, how you've developed that research, and, and we have some more findings uh, today that we can release. Yeah. Uh, hi, um, Lucy. So, yeah, just briefly to remind everyone what the COVID anxiety syndrome is it's a collection fundamentally of behaviors, which include avoidance, worry, monitoring for threat checking that keep us locked into a state of anxiety and fear regarding um, the threat uh, of the virus. Um, we did a series of studies over the last year to look at um, the sort of percentage of the population that uh, was displaying the syndrome. And we do have some interesting findings that were collected on June 21st this year. Um, a survey of 975 UK-based participants. And those findings show? Those findings show that 40% of the sample uh, endorse strongly avoiding touching things in public spaces because of the fear of contracting the virus. 30% uh, strongly endorse avoiding public transport because of the fear of contracting the virus. Approximately one quarter of the participants strongly endorse avoiding going out to public uh, places uh, because of the fear of the virus. Another quarter strongly endorse playing, uh, pay, uh, paying, uh, sorry, endorse paying close attention to others displaying symptoms. So there's an attentional bias. And around one in 10, uh, endorse uh, that they're still reading uh, news and information uh, relating to the pandemic at the cost of their day-to-day -day life. So presumably these people are a broad spectrum of people. They're not, there's no particular gender or age bias. Are there any predicting factors in what, you know, in who are, uh, who are most affected? Are they more vulnerable? So in terms of this, this latest data set, um, the only variable that uh, emerged as a predictor is um, whether individuals had lost somebody they loved to, uh, to COVID. Interestingly, uh, age, gender, vaccination status did not predict the syndrome. So being vaccinated didn't make it less likely to be displaying features of the syndrome. So your research does suggest that these behaviours are locked into these people which are disproportionate to the actual threat because going on public transport, the chance of uh, right now picking up and dying or become seriously ill from coronavirus are infinitesimally small, I presume. So how do you think this has happened? Why has it happened? Yeah, as, as we discussed in the past, this has happened because there was an initial threat. Um, March, April, May, June last year, people were dying and there was a, this new virus going around. Um, we were asked to behave in certain ways to keep safe. Um, we did so. Uh, but I think we, we probably have done so for too long. And we go back to this idea that I mentioned to you in the past of the multiplier effect between lockdown and sort of mixed or even fear messaging. We've had 12, 15 months of being quite isolated 
and at the same time being at the receiving end of powerful and sometimes very fear-inducing messages um, about the virus. We're also asked to adopt certain behaviors, such as covering our face, uh, avoiding public uh, uh, places, monitoring for threat in the environment, spotting the virus in the environment, as we again discussed in the past. And these behaviors have been so well practiced for a significant minority that abandoning them, letting them go, seems to be very difficult because why would one out of five of our respondents in June, end of June, so one month after a significant degree of unlocking, why would one out of five people still endorse severe levels of the syndrome? There's also another chunk that don't reach that level of severity, maybe yeah. two out of, the re- out of the remaining four, that are still endorsing items quite strongly relating to the syndrome. Do you think that, um, I mean, I have spoken to behavioral psychologists about it and they did use certain techniques to keep us in line and they would claim that it was the virus that has led to this fear. It is a deadly virus. It has been frightening people. Um, Why do you think it's more to do with the messaging? So again, we go back to this distinction between fear and control. So we all throughout the course of life have fearful thoughts that come to our mind, memories, disturbing events uh, that cause distress. And uh, we can't really control this. So it's natural to have feared the virus. It's natural to have felt uh, a personal threat. Um, What is more questionable is what we do when we manage this fear. So if we start avoiding If we start overchecking, overcleaning, it might paradoxically lock our fear in. So there's this important distinction to be made in a way in in mental health between an intrusive experience, without being too technical, but an intrusive experience, which is the fear and what we do to manage it, which which are, sorry, the behaviors that are part of the syndrome. So I think we have sort of engaged in these behaviors to manage the fear for too long. And do you think this is replicated across other parts of the world? Is Britain particularly, have they got a particular problem, relatively speaking? So yes, Uh, I, I think that the UK, Italy and the United States, according to unpublished data, that we are, we've analyzed and we're writing up as, as a report just now, it, it does appear that Italy, the UK, uh, and uh, the United States have fared worse in terms of the syndrome compared to other European countries, especially it, it appears to be the case of Germany uh, that has fared much, much better, and certainly when compared to China. So... <laughs> And that's on the syndrome. Our study is also looking at many other variables and it's controlling for for over 50 sociodemographic variables. So it's going to be a very extensive study. But I can tell you that the the picture for the UK is certainly on the negative side of of the spectrum. And not only for COVID-19 anxiety syndrome, also for other related constructs, such as uh, health anxiety, and and uh, etc. Uh, so, but going back to the COVID nineteen anxiety syndrome, yes, the 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 element, especially the element that has to do with worrying, um, um, is seems to be more marked. Sorry, my mistake. Uh, the the element that has to do with avoidance seems to have, have been particularly strong in the UK. Hence, in a way, this finding is relevant now. Because as we're opening up, the reported levels of um, uh, the syndrome that relate to avoidance of public spaces, uh, of uh, public places to, are still very high, between 20 and 40%. They're not that different from what they were in February and March. But we've opened now. So it, it seems that there hasn't been a big shift. 
So this is a worry, isn't it? If Boris uh, Johnson announces an opening up on July the 19th and gives people personal responsibility for wearing masks and other social distancing measures, then if we have people who are locked in in this way, how do we get round that? I know that the unions are very worried about people not wearing masks on public transport and teachers are keen for masks to be in school, in place in school. Um, what what do we do about that? We can't just flip a switch. Exactly. It's going to be very difficult to, to flip a switch. We know that there is quite a lot of evidence indicating that maybe masks are not as protective as we think they are, at least certain types of masks. In the in community. Community-based com- mask wearing, there's no good evidence for. Yeah. But for some reason, people seem to think that they are, they're basing their opinions on on lab-based studies, which are quite different. I think uh, people yeah. wear masks and put them in their pocket and put them on the Correct. dashboard. And yeah. I think there's reinfection from cloth, ma- cloth masks as well. Um, yeah. I've seen evidence of that. So, But, I mean, masks are very public health. England people have told me that one of the reasons why, it was a political reason to use, to put masks in place, because it does increase fear and it makes people alert to a virus. So this is symbolic, isn't it? I mean, is that one of the things that you've seen in yeah. your... So yeah. I, 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 I presume that from my psychological perspective, yes. yeah. the, the continued use of masks in view of the very low infection to fatality rates, the very high levels of herd immunity, the very high levels um, of vaccination, uh, continuing to wear masks to an extent is, is probably more akin to a safety behavior, a psychological safety behavior, than actually something that is necessary. Now, there might be exceptions to this. There might be uh, um, an, an elderly individual or somebody um, with uh, a, a, a condition that puts them at greater risk, and they might they might decide to wear the mask also for a sort of from a protection point of view, physical protection, health protection point of view. But in view of all the information we've got, um, it would appear that for the vast majority of individuals, wearing a mask is probably more of a psychological safety behavior. Yes. I mean, the point is that um, if we do it for COVID-19 at this point, with levels of immunity so high, um, we'd probably have to we'd be able to justify doing it for every respiratory virus. And is that where we want to go as a society? What does it mean when you see a mask? It, it, it you know, Psychologically, is it something that um, keeps oh, for, our... Le- from- yeah. Yeah, for me, it means distance uh, from other individuals. It, it, it means that those individuals are likely to be in some state of anxiety or concern. And I would wonder what would happen if they did take these masks off in certain situations, as we've discussed. From a social point of view, it affects very deeply and profoundly our capacity to relate to others. And I wonder whether we want as a society to have all these massive costs for an illness that now appears to be as lethal, if not less lethal, than the regular flu. Do we want to mask ourselves from September to May? Um, And then if the weather is bad, maybe continue to mask ourselves until June and only be unmasked in July and August and maybe only be unmasked uh, outside. It's... Do we want to live like that? And from my perspective, looking at the data on on the one hand and knowing about how the mind works, it would appear that at this point, the mask is more of a safety behavior. So how do we unwind? If Boris Johnson tells us one day to wear masks and then suddenly on the July the 19th, it's no longer appropriate. For many people, that doesn't seem to make sense. Is it? Would it be better, not that it would be justified, would it be better to slowly move people out of this state of fear that many are in and move them more slowly towards an unlocking? How, how do we do it? So I think over the last week to 10 days, we've had more consistent and positive messaging coming through from, from government about the fact that maybe the virus is endemic and that there are ways to treat it and manage it. High proportions of people are vaccinated. 
So I think that from that perspective, things have been improving. And I welcome on the 19th of July, the possibility of deciding whether we wear masks or not. And um, as long as wearing a mask is a personal decision, I'm personally okay with it. So um, if a person wants to wear, an individual wants to wear a mask on public transport because they are particularly anxious uh, this coming autumn, so be it. But what I would disagree is the imposition of ma mask wearing to others. For me, that's the, the, the fundamental. Uh, so, But wasn't the point uh, I, that I, they made that, that masks were meant to protect other people, not to protect the wearer? And if there is a vulnerable individual there who may have you know, underlying health conditions, you're doing it as a selfless act. That was the messaging, wasn't it? That was the messaging. And I wonder if that messaging is still relevant or accurate in view of what we know about yeah. how ma whether masks protect us or not. Yes, exactly, which so. is very limited. And if you are ill, then you don't expect everyone else to behave in a certain way because you have an underlying condition. Well, we never have before, uh, you know. Correct. Uh, so, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So do you think that we have a very strong team of behavioral psychologists and interestingly, it is them that seem to be the most uh, concerned about removing these what they call safety belts uh, and you know road signs as they've called it and all these things that they think will or believe will help protect us from the virus. Do you think that team of psychologists have had a big play in why Britain is so particularly fearful? Why, why has it happened in UK particularly? It's a good question. I mean, I don't know the ins and outs of the behavioral insights team. Uh, I, if, I'm not sure if the name is correct. Um, uh, certainly the messaging that we've been exposed to in the UK with regards to the threat of the virus has been uh, very powerful. And I wonder why at this moment in time we do have behavioral scientists who are continuing to tell us to wear a mask for a, for a reason that is supposed to be physical or biological. So my question is why, why are behavioral scientists talking about masks, uh, you know, relating to, to, to safety? Why don't we have medics telling us that we should be going around wearing masks? That's, that's the main question I have. Yes, I have a similar question. Um, is that I think we've covered everything. Do you want anything else, Dan? I think that was really good. Uh, <laughs> it was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so um, returning to normal life we, is going to be a challenge. We, you know, this is recorded, so it might be we might add something. But returning to normal life is going to be a challenge. People may not want to go back in the office. We're going to this will have a knock-on effect on our economy and our society unless we get it right. I think it will because we still have one person out of five who displays really marked levels of the syndrome. So if this continues unabated, it will affect uh, our economy, it, it will affect schooling, it will affect our personal relationships, our friendships. We might end up having a sort of two-tier society of individuals who are still very anxious and avoidant, and others who are willing to return to the office, we're happy to go back to school and behave the way they used to, and others will refuse. But do you think just watching normal life will tri trickle down and people will start to think, well, they're not going to die? Correct. What we now need is examples of being together, sharing our lives, um, re-engaging. We know that fear is acquired through modeling, through observing others. So it can also it can also be sort of we can't really unlearn it, but it can be re significantly re reduced by seeing the alternative model: people singing at the stadium, people returning to the theater, people going away on holiday and enjoying a dinner with a table of thirty individuals. On that's what we need because it will trickle down to those who are maybe doubtful. Yeah. 
So life again. And this has okay. never been seen before. We've had pandemics before, haven't we? Perhaps none that had such an impact on social media and 24-7 news broadcasts as this. And maybe that's one of the reasons. But we've never, this has never been characterized before. This is completely new. It's not the same as OCD and it's not the same as people who... No, we know it's, it's, it's not the same as, as OCD. We know that it's separate from health anxiety. Uh, we know that it uh, predicts uh, behavior and outcomes independent of vaccination status, yeah. previous mental health problems. Right. It's a standalone yeah. entity. And we, we also know this because clinical psychologists uh, are contacting me and Professor Anna Nikšević, Professor Nik Anna Nikšević and I, uh, asking us what to do, how to classify, how to make sense yeah. of this of this presentation yeah. because they can't call it OCD. They can't call it PTSD. Yeah. Maybe there's some underlying depression now and a lot of people because of the lockdowns, but they struggle to, to give it a name and increasingly yeah. they're giving it this name, a pandemic related phenomenon. TV channels, which are showing pictures of dying people. We've never really seen that before. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and just, I mean, this is the last thing, but you know, what other things, the messaging came from where? Who did that messaging? Can you identify? I mean, there was posters up, wasn't there? Looker in the eyes. What are, what yeah. kind of things have you? There were seen? posters up. There were decisions to report, you know, death rates, uh, rates of deaths every day. Out of context. Um, yeah, and uh, there uh, there were decisions to report case numbers every day. There was all this issue as to whether. Um, being a case means you're ill, which, you know, it doesn't because there are many people who are positive who are asymptomatic or not ill at all. So there could have been a decision to focus on a more balanced message. And, and one last thing, I mean, uh, yeah. any preprint or non-peer reviewed paper about a new variant that has been modeled to be more deadly or more transmissible is also given front page news. So it's constant and no it, other, yeah. other, other sort of problems like, well, things that we should be worried about, cancer, heart disease, loneliness, yeah. depression, they haven't had a look in. So uh, sort of a myopic. And it, and it goes back to this, to this research that I've just tweeted about where our attention becomes locked. And so we seem to, at this moment in time, be only thinking of one source of potential death. Yes. COVID. Yeah. And forgetting, like many other individuals have said, that there are many other potential sources of death with much higher multipliers in terms of chances of, yeah. of dying. 